Hi, everybody. Glad you could make it. It's good to be here. I will be your tour guide for the next hour or so to go through some of the concepts of deep learning. Before getting into that, just with a show of hands, how many people are, are new to deep learning? Okay, I guess you're in the right place, and the others are experts, so they will be correcting me as I go through this. Um, I'm going to skip some of the slides, but they'll be uh, online uh, on SlideShare, plus it'll be recorded. And I'm going to, I guess, probably skip over some of the more sort of mundane details, not mundane, the uh, use cases, which are not mundane, um, and the, some of the history. So I'm going to try to get the stuff that you can understand the concepts, because after you understand the concepts, <clears throat> the APIs, well, guess what? It's just the code that implements you know, the concepts. And so if you've tried it the other way, and if you've been lucky that way, you've been more successful than me, because I did try doing it that way and I got nowhere. So with that in mind, here's just a little quick um, overview of some of the things we're going to be talking about. And they kind of come together and cluster some of these concepts. So it's not that it's exactly sequential, it's more, this is the kind of stuff that we'll be uh, going over. And so with that, <clears throat> I think this slide is a little bit out of date. I'm not sure, I don't remember where I got it, but uh, you don't have to learn all of these things to do deep learning. We're gonna concentrate on the red dot. And the data science part is a little bit off. You can actually do deep learning with data science. You can, with R, R Studio, there's an interface uh, to be able to do Keras and TensorFlow. And it looks very similar, and what it does in brief there's this bridge class that essentially uh, uh, delegates the work to Python. So it's actually very clever. The, the guy who wrote um, R Studio, I think he wrote uh, that interface with the author of Keras. And the other thing is <clears throat> something that's not here, something called uh, reinforcement learning. And if you've heard of those systems where they play a million uh, games or a million times against themselves, like uh, AlphaGo, that's reinforcement learning. So that's one thing that would probably be a good thing to have in there. And just so you know, the, um, the original one was AlphaGo. I don't remember the, 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 the exact names of the next one. There was, there's AlphaGo Zero and then Alpha Zero. And it's interesting <clears throat> because AlphaGo was had some human collaboration and alpha zero was purely completely all software no human interaction so the system learned how to play go then it played the original alpha go and i think it won 75 out of 100 matches and the time it took from starting to finishing those games any guesses some of you might know Four hours. Wow. It just crushes the competition. It's kind of exhilarating in a way. I don't know what, where that's going to go. But anyway, so here's one thing I put in because last year was the first time Gartner put deep learning separate. And I was a little bit surprised because deep learning has been kind of the, the driving force in AI the last you know, five or six years. So glad to see that. Machine learning is a little bit to the right. So I guess it's farther ahead to go wherever it's going to go. And so let's see what it does this year. I think they usually come out in October. These people put together the first AI conference in the summer of 1956 at Dartmouth. And in case you're wondering, John McCarthy, he just happened to be the inventor of LISP. There's Claude Shannon, who happened to be the inventor of information theory, also called the God, uh, the uh, Da Vinci of um, the 20th century. I almost said Godfather, but that's Jeffrey Hinton. You'll get to him later. And there's also Marvin Minsky, one of the giants over there at uh, uh, MIT. And so what I really like about it is that they thought that they would get it all done by the end of the summer. <laughs> that's optimism for you. And so basically, in the 50s, by that time, you could sort of think of it as having penciled in, if you will, um, traditional AI, which was um, 
based on uh, expert systems that were very popular in the 80s, and they're still useful, and uh, versus machine learning, deep learning, which was about lots of data, lots of inexpensive computing power, algorithms, and of course for deep learning, uh, deep neural networks. And so that's it for the history. You can read about more of it if you want online. This is the main thing we're gonna look at. Spend a few minutes on this. And <clears throat> you might be wondering, what is this thing for? Well, it's labeled, of course, you have the input layer, there's an output layer, and these hidden layers. So the idea is to come up with a set of numbers for the edges so that you get a neural network that models the data well, whatever that means. And once you're done with that, you freeze the model, and then you test it with your test data. And if the percentage accuracy is roughly the same, you've got a good model. Of course, the devil's in the details. And so the question you might be wondering is, how do you figure out how many layers to have? That's not obvious. It's actually an example of something called a hyperparameter, which is something that you set before the training process. So the number of hidden layers, hyperparameter. The number of nodes in the layers, hyperparameter. The initial values for the weights, hyperparameter. And there are lots more of them, we'll get to them. So let's just, to keep make it simple, let's just assume that the initial weights are random numbers for a normal N01 distribution. It's not that important for our purposes tonight. And <clears throat> so what you do with these frameworks is provide input data, and it's in the form of a vector, and it's numeric. And so in between the two layers, you see all those edges, you represent those weights with a matrix. So when you have a set of input numbers, you multiply by the matrix, and then the next one, and the next one, and then you get to the end. And let's just pretend that there's only one node at the end. Because uh, the example I'm going to use, we'll get into more detail later, is like something like housing. So uh, you may have seen spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, where you have rows of data. And there are many attributes that you can have for uh, features for a house number of square feet, bedrooms, all that stuff. I think I saw one uh, spreadsheet that had 30 features. So you pass in those features, the values for each row, and then when you get to the end, you get a number, and you compare that with the actual cost of the house that's in the row in the spreadsheet. They're going to be different. And so going from left to right is forward propagation. What we need to do or the frameworks do for us, is somehow go the other direction. It's called backprop or backward error propagation in such a way that we modify the weights to make it better because we want to minimize the error. So we'll see more of this too. What happens is we have a cost function that's based on the parameters of the network. This is all done for us. And what we try to, what we do or what it does for us is find a way to get toward whatever the minimum is for that curve, that surface. And if it's in multiple dimensions, we can't see it. So it uses gradient descent, if you haven't heard of that before, essentially partial derivatives, and it computes using the chain rule, partial derivatives and the product of numbers, and it involves something called the learning rate, which is also a hyperparameter, which kind of controls the rate at which you move forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, uh, what happens is basically right over here, compute this number and then update the weights. They could increase, they could decrease, it could be zero, and then do that with the next layer back. So um, you get to all the way to the beginning, you've modified the network. And so then you do that with the next row. So for example, something like MNIST has 60,000 rows for training. And if you, each time you go through all this set of rows, that's called an epoch. So <clears throat> it's actually quite common to go through the uh, data set 20 times. So that means you've gone forward and back 1.2 million times. 
so you expect it's going to have something of value when you're done with that. And when you, you're done, again, you get the test, the, uh, test data, which is about 10,000 rows. And if the difference in the percentage accuracy is significant, it's probably a case of overfitting, which is not unique to deep learning. It happens with machine learning and other systems. And has anyone not heard of overfitting? OK, I don't have to explain it. Good. So with that in mind, um, here's what I'm going to do. Um, there's basically three large categories of algorithms. One type <clears throat> is uh, clustering, uh, k-means, k-nearest neighbor, in case you've heard of that. And there's also something called mean shift, which is an alternative where you don't have to specify the number of uh, clusters. And we're not going to do that tonight, but we're going to look at classifiers, which are things that will try to figure out which object or thing is in at the end of this whole process from a list of things that you already know. For example, you might have like a dog, cat, fish, bird. And so you've got some images and you want to figure out what's in there. Well, that's what that system will do. That's a classifier. There's also ones where they only have two outputs, true, false, spam, not spam. Uh, will the stock price go up or down? So it's binary. There's also, in the case of MNIST, you have 10 different digits. So you're going to have a classifier trying to figure out which of those 10 digits. The other category is called regression. <clears throat> And those are the kind that are basically continuous values. So instead of saying, is the stock price going to go up or down, what's the stock price going to be? What's the temperature going to be? Barometric pressure, heartbeat, heart rate, that sort of stuff. So with that in mind, let's take a look at, I'm going to do a very simple example. You may not have seen this before. You won't have to remember this because you'll be doing this kind of stuff with frameworks, but just to give you an idea of what's happening, I think you'll be impressed later with what the frameworks do. So here's an example. We're going to try to figure out, <clears throat> pardon my lame artwork here, uh, we've got these red dots, they're in the upper half of the plane, and then the blue dots in the lower half. And so the dividing line is y equals zero. Notice there's a unit vector. Everyone knows, uh, familiar with vectors? OK, good. So it's a unit vector pointing in the direction of the data that we want, which is determine is a random point going to be a red dot or not. So how do we convert this diagram into a network? There it is. Again, my manual artwork here. You notice the value 0, 1. Where does that come from? 0, 1. 0 for x, 1 for y. That's going to be the weight. So what we do, and what the systems do, is they take the inner product of whatever value for x and y is supplied, which is going to be a point in the plane. So x and y, inner product with 0, 1, what does that give us? x times 0 is 0 always, y times 1. We compare it y with 0, which is the threshold value. And when will that fire? When y is bigger than or equal to 0. We knew that. This has to be the same. Pretty simple, straightforward, trivial. OK, let's do it four times. Now, take a look at this one. You see at the bottom, that's still the same thing. And now we've got B, C, and D, four lines. They are actually going to be half planes. The intersection is going to be the square. Each one of them has an inward pointing normal vector, perpendicular. And if we just take those numbers, we're going to have x, y input, but we're going to have four nodes, four neurons, each one corresponding to a line. Everyone with me? OK, so here's what it looks like. Remember, A was 0, 1. I just moved it up to the top. And then B, C, and D, the numbers on the left side. Now. Just not worry about the numbers in the middle, the threshold values for the moment. But we've got ones coming out. So when all four of those threshold values are met or exceeded, 
is going to emit a 1, and each 4 multiplied by 1, the sum total is 4, then we'll know that that point is inside that rectangle, actually the square. Does that make sense? So, <clears throat> the only part that might be a little tricky is those threshold values. And I'll just tell you what it is. For the first quadrant, it's a little bit different for the other ones, but for horizontal lines, you need to take the negative of the y-intercept. For vertical lines, the negative of the x-intercept. So, going from A counterclockwise, the intercepts are the values, 0, 1, 1, and 0. So the negatives are 0, negative 1, negative 1, 0. Right? Okay, so let's look back. Where did I put it? Right there. So you see from the top to bottom, 0, negative 1, negative 1, 0. Let's test this. Let's take the origin. We're going to include the boundaries, the the perimeter as part of the included as red dots. So, zero, zero, if we supply x and y of zero, zero, well, anything times zero is zero added, it's all zero. So, we're going to get a column of numbers to the left of the middle nodes are going to be zeros. Do they all equal or exceed the threshold value? Yes. One is emitted, four of them, we get four, it's a red dot. Let's try one more. Let's try one, one. So now what happens? When we put one and one for x and y, what happens is with the inner product, you're just adding the two weights from x and y to a particular node. So, <clears throat> so in this case, it's one, negative one, negative one, and one. And in all four cases, that number equals or exceeds the threshold value. So ones are emitted, and we get a four, and it works, right? Everyone convinced? You can try more values if you want, but I know it works, so I'm going to leave it at that. So before we get too farther on this one, what if we had a triangle? Then we'd have three nodes, three ones, and a three. What about a pentagon? It'd be five nodes, five ones and a five. Now you have to figure out what the threshold values are. And the, um, the uh, weights there, because it's going to be the perpendicular vector pointing inward inside that shape. A little bit of work, if you want to do it. What if we had an n gone? Well, then it would be n nodes, n ones and an n. What if we had two rectangles, one with the current one, and then one in, say, the upper left, upper right corner someplace? What would happen? Well, it turns out that vectors are invariant under translation. So those four vectors will work for the other rectangle that we have somewhere else. So that means what we do is we replicate those four nodes. The weights are the same, the ones are the same, and then there's another node with a four, but you have to get the uh, threshold values based on what I was saying before. Does that make sense? Sort of? So what if you have this really weird shape that isn't a polygon? Well, one thing you could do is to take the left and right extreme, take the difference, say divide it up into 100 partition of 100 uh, segments, and then what you could do is construct line segments for the top and the bottom, you have a, two, a, a polygon with 200 sides, which we talked about. What if someone says, I have a polygon that's not convex? No problem, because every closed polygon can be decomposed into a set of closed convex polygons in the plane, if you need that. So basically, we're done. So this is, you've now sort of completed exercise set number one. And this is also kind of interesting because these operators are basically the corners of the square. And that one at the bottom is very interesting. It's the XOR. And uh, it turns out that Marvin Minsky from the Gang of Five and uh, 
forgot his name. I always forget his name. The guy who invented logo, Seymour Peppert. They wrote a paper in the late 60s proving that when you have XOR, it's not linearly separable with one layer. And that could have also been part of the reason there was the AI winter. I remember, Marvin was part of that group, so it wasn't like he had an axe to grind, but I think it was sort of, I can imagine the conversation. Really interesting theoretical stuff, but kind of useless, because you can't even do this. Fortunately, things have changed. We've got algorithms. We've got a lot of other things. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. So it, if you want an exercise, I haven't done it myself, just, but it's maybe worth doing that manually if you want to get a little bit more practice. Try this one. This one's a confidence builder. You're doing it in 3D. I've yet to do that one too, but I'll get around to it. So again, instead of having an inward pointing vector for a line, you're going to have an inward pointing vector for a plane. And there are six planes. There are four vertices at the top, four at the bottom, so you have those to deal with. And you're going to have the intercepts and all that other stuff. So that's what frameworks will do for you, so you don't have to sit down and do it manually. Imagine if you had a polygon with 10,000 sides. Think of the work that you would have to do. Not even, you know, Dustin Hoff and Rain Man could do this kind of stuff, you know, a thousand times a day. So it really spares us a, a tremendous amount of work having these frameworks. And now, a couple of things to keep in mind. This network doesn't learn. There's no back propagation, no cost function, nothing. And it's because the so-called, well, the cost function, you remember I kept saying it's either going to emit a one, and I didn't say zero, but if it doesn't fire, it's a zero. Zero one is binary. And the interesting thing is we need something that, if you look at the, it's going to be a segment like this and something like that. One, zero, or for you, it would be that the other way. If we connect those two things smoothly, sort of kind of approximating it, what would the shape be? Kind of an S shape. What function does that bring to mind? Sigmoid. sigmoid. What's interesting is that the sigmoid function gives us intermediate values instead of all or nothing. And that's what you need when your network is going to learn, because you're going to be tweaking those numbers. When I say you, I mean you or the framework. What's interesting is, because of those continuous values, it's really like an analog device. Maybe a little counterintuitive, but that's what we need. So let's take a look at something that's kind of the opposite. Instead of separating things into one group and another, we're going to try to get a cluster of numbers and try to fit something so they're opposite. Not separate, but approximate. And so linear regression has been around, I think, about 200 years. I think Carl, Carl Gauss was the person who started that. And so this is the simple case. We're not looking at all the other ones where it could be quadratic and cubic. Just a nice little cluster of numbers. And this is not curve fitting. It has nothing to do with that. The ideal line might, they might intersect all of them, most, some, or none. What we want is to find a line that is the least far away from the points based on the vertical distance of those points from that line. So you take the difference for each of the, the y coordinate for each of those points to that line, square it so there's no negative values in cancellation, add them up, divide by the number of points. What does that give you? It's a quadratic function. Everything's now negative. It's going to be actually I think I can just go there. So if you if you look at this, it kind of looks like it's the best fitting line somehow. Because if you move it up or down, that's changing the value of B. Either you increase B or decrease. If you rotate it, you're increasing M or decreasing M. Those two variables are independent. So they would be like in the plane. And whatever combination of M and B that you get will produce an error value. 
And obviously the error is not going to be zero, otherwise it'd have to be, all, all the points would have to be on the line. So the error, other than that optimal line, is going to be bigger than zero, and it's quadratic, so I'll spare you the suspense, that's what it looks like. It's a convex surface. So it has either a global maximum or global minimum. You don't have to worry about saddle points. That'll come up later. Or local minimum, local maximum, that kind of stuff. So the point at the bottom gives you the value of M and B for that best fitting line. So imagine two perpendicular planes intersecting parallel to these axes. You get two parabolas. They intersect at that point. Why do you want to look at the parabolas? Because you can take the partial derivative. Everybody remember how to do derivatives? The slope of the tangent to a curve. It will be zero at that point in both the M and the B. So it's going to be partial derivative with respect to M and B, set it equal to zero. There's a closed form solution. Basically done. Let's pretend we didn't know that. And we had a value of M and B that would put us somewhere in that curve. How would we go, in general terms, from whatever MB value put us over here to the bottom, to the minimum? How would we get there? By something called gradient descent. Imagine that point that there's a tiny little sphere and you release it. What's, what path is it going to take? Whatever way this maximum descent Think of yourself being on the side of a hill in the mountain range, and you want to go downward. Which way are you going to go? Where it's steepest. It's a greedy algorithm. That's really all there is to it, in essence. Of course, in practice, there are things that come up. Just make a mental note of this point, because that'll come up a little bit later. And so, as an example, I mentioned real estate. So let's say horizontal axis is the number of square feet, vertical is uh, the cost of a house. Very coarse-grained approximation. What we want is something with more features like that. I came up with six. As I mentioned, uh, there are some data sets that have 30 of them. So those are the numbers in the spreadsheet for each row is the values for a house. And the rightmost number is the actual cost. So remember, you feed in all the values for a given row, the values of those features, Go through this network and then compare the result with the cost that's in the spreadsheet. We talked a little bit about that before. So he, just more e equations, I see how it generalizes. We have, instead of y equals mx plus b, we have x1 to xn, and then b is the bias, the intercept. So just to go back, so now when we're taking those numbers, again, we go through all the way to the end. And there's one thing that I conveniently neglected to tell you. This is a linear system. So by analogy, if you take the number 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, what's that? 120. So if you're writing a program, are you going to use Put in 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 every time you need it, or are you just going to use 120? Obviously the latter. Well, the analogy I'm trying to make is when we take that first matrix, we can immediately multiply by the next matrix and all the way down to the end and produce one matrix, which collapses this whole system to input and output. We want to prevent that from happening, so we need to introduce nonlinearity. And that's done by activation functions, one of which is sigmoid. Another one is tan h, another one is rel u. There's, there's elu, there's the exponential one. There's, there's uh, rel u 6, where it cuts off at 6. That's specific to TensorFlow. And all these systems have all the other ones. So what happens is you have the numbers, the vector coming in, multiply by that first matrix, then that new vector, each one of the values, you pass through the activation function to get a new vector. Then you multiply by the next matrix. Does that make sense? Just by analogy, if you go driving on the highway, and there's nobody around, you can drive at a constant speed. If you go in a parking lot where there's speed bumps, 
it interrupts your flow. You slow down, you move up, you can't go straight through. Or toll booths, or whatever analogy helps you with the concept. So we can't just immediately go all the way through to the end. That's what the activation function does. And also enables us to find those computations with the smaller numbers so that we adjust the weights. It's all about the weights. That's what counts. And there's no a priori, priori way of knowing which weights are the best. That's why you write these systems and you experiment with the different number of layers and so forth. So when we get to the end, which we're well, assuming is just a one node, we have a cost function, kind of like the one that was there, that's called mean squared error. And then you take these partial derivatives. It's called the gradient because the derivative, the slope of a tangent, only applies to two dimensions. When you're in multiple dimensions, you've got different axes, and so it's going to be a partial derivative for each of those axes, and that is a vector of values. That's where you go. So when you see the diagrams online about going to the minimum, it kind of zigzags. It's because of that. There is no straight line down, rarely, unless this, the numbers just work out that way. So, now we've got the idea, cost function, we need that. We need the gradient descent method. There's like five or six of them, also a hyperparameter, and the learning rate. We must have those three things to do backpropagation. We also need an activation function that prevents it from collapsing down, so it has to be nonlinear. So that's the minimum. And then, if you have at least two hidden layers, that's deep learning. If you have at least 10 hidden layers, it's called very deep learning. Seriously, I thought it was going to be like 500 when I, it's such a small number. Oh, by the way, the state of the art with neural networks, 2011, somebody came up with a six hidden layer neural network. That was state of the art. And then things kind of blew up, and there was a competition in 2012, I think it was AlexNet, 150 hidden layers, then Microsoft, 1,000 layers. And then they have these massive networks. I have no idea how they come up with it. How do they test it? How, do they, how long does it take? Jeffrey, um, Jeff Dean, he's the head of Google Brain, uh, usually legendary is the word that precedes his name, and he really is wicked smart. I was at the Matroid last year. It's coming up next weekend, I think. He mentioned, well, you probably want to avoid training neural networks that takes more than three or four days. <laughs> Thanks. So that's another factor. And then you get to TPUs with TensorFlow, the tensor processing unit, and on and on, all that kind of stuff. So, but this is the basic fundamental idea. Forward propagation, back propagation, go through an epoch, multiple epochs, shift the data around, they shuffle it, this, that, and the other, and then to get the best number you can. How to come up with that? Go to Kaggle, go to GitHub, borrow what other people have done. Start with one layer, experiment with it, you know, work with Python if you prefer, or with Java, or you can do Scala, and you can use Keras. I recommend Keras, it's a lot more intuitive, as you'll see in a few minutes. And then when you really want to get the horsepower, you can use TensorFlow or PyTorch as well. That's another one that's popular with some people. So these are just the equations I'm skipping, skipping, and okay, so Euler's function. Does everyone remember Euler's constant? Or who does remember, I should say? That's, remember, when you studied math, there was L-O-G, log, that's base 10. And then there was L-N, that's base E. That's this number, it's 2.718, whatever. Pardon? So what's interesting is this is the only non-zero function, differentiable function in the plane that equals its own derivative. And it has a lot of applications in a lot of systems. There's sigmoid. If you multiply everything by e to the x, it's e to the x divided by e to the x plus 1. So you can see that it, the denominator is just a little bit bigger. So it's going to be between 0 and 1, monotonically increasing. 
it does, and you'll hear the term squashing. You can take any set of numbers, pass them through that, they'll be like probabilities, because they'll all be between zero and one. The soft max, max function is similar, except the difference is that the numbers that you pass in will, will also be between zero and one, but the sum will equal one. And that's important, especially for CNNs, which we'll see later. And so here's 10H. And now, this is the darling of the day, the year, I guess. ReLU, uh, very simple to compute. There's a point there at zero where it's continuous but not differentiable. So it's a little bit, not to worry, it all works. And this is kind of the, this is not completely correct, I spotted it a while ago, but I haven't updated the slide. Um, that's the softmax. So essentially, instead of saying x1 over x1 plus xn, and then x2, raise everything so that it's e to that power. Does that make sense? If you drop the e's, that's just the proportional weight for the set of numbers. Of course, if you take x1 to all the way to xn, that could be zero, but that won't happen when it's the exponent, because it has to be at least one the sum. And just real quick, look at, this is in Python, you look at the middle one. What's the 10H activation function? It's called 10H. Very nice and convenient. The first one, one over one plus E to the negative power, that's essentially that. And then the uh, ReLU is the max of zero and the dot product. So kind of simple and straightforward. And there are other ones as well. You can check them out uh, online. So I mentioned this already. ReLU is the is the one. Now, what about the uh, cost functions? We saw this before. That's the simplest one. And here's another one that has a saddle point because at one direction it's a minimum, and the other way it's a maximum. And there are techniques for getting away from those sorts of things. Remember, if in three dimensions, it's easy to see. If it's 100 dimensions, obviously, you're not going to be able to see it because you can't draw it. So there's something called momentum. And there's Nesterov momentum, which is built into TensorFlow. And you can specify a value. It's kind of like the way I think of it when I first made sense, was you're in an airplane, and there's turbulence. and Pardon me. Um, and so you know, you're wondering, how long can I take this before I vomit? And then the pilot switches on that extra power, and you get out of there, and you relax. So that's kind of what you need to do, the momentum to get out of there. But the thing is, how do you know that it's the saddle point? Maybe it is really the global minimum. So you compare, OK, you're going to give it the momentum, you go out, but oh, wait, it's actually increasing, and it should be decreasing. Oh, we are got to go back. So there's this kind of game, and there's like five or six of them. They're each better than the one before. And you, there's ad, RMS prop, Adagrad. I don't remember the names, um, but they're all built in. So uh, hyperparameter. And here's another one. This is the uh, cross-entropy function, which is not really intuitive, but it's a measure of kind of the, the, the extent to which two probability distributions differ. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it works and you can use it, treat it as black box until eventually it starts making sense. That's kind of how I did it. And there's going to be a lot of that when you're plugging in left and right and trying things. So it feels like seat of the pants programming. It, it's deep learning is about heuristics. And you try something, it does or doesn't work, and then you have an idea to do something, and you ask somebody, well, what would happen if it did that? Try it. And you do it, and then it works really well, and then you go to the big standard data sets, and you get better performance than they do, and then you write a paper, and you put it in an archive, and everybody goes, great, we got a new technique. That's basically how it works. So there's not a lot of documentation. Those papers can be difficult to read. So. There you have it. And selecting a cost function, just general kind of rules. If it's mean squared error, that, use a mean squared error for regression. Binary cross entropy, categorical cross entropy, 
this may not make a whole lot of sense right now, but there are some guidelines for selecting that uh, cost function. Now, something else I wanted to tell you um, about the, um, the data. Generally, you try to keep things normalized. It just works better. So, for example, with <clears throat> CNNs, pixel values are between 0 and 255. You divide by 255, is between 0 and 1. One of the big time sinks with machine learning is feature extraction. Figuring out which ones are more important and the ones that are less important. You might have 100 features and five of them are really important. Another five are kind of sort of. And then the other 90, that long tail might be almost negligible. So a lot of time spent figuring that out, cleaning the data. No duplicates, no incorrect data, no missing data. If you have data that's incorrect, what's the correct value? What do you do? Sometimes you just oh, replace it by the average. Sometimes you put zero. Sometimes you drop the row. What if that represents an outlier? Is the outlier significant? Well, if it's like the stock market, you bet it is. So you have to have a good, solid understanding of the, or work with someone who does, who has domain expertise with the data. Can you drop a column or add a column? It's not obvious. So you go through all this process, and then what you do with deep learning is for each of those features, you normalize. It's actually standardized, but it's you will see normalized being used. It means something that's slightly different. And so you transform the data so that it's N01, meaning it's a Gaussian distribution, mean zero, standard deviation one. Well, you do that with the data, then it's all sort of level playing field. How do you figure out which features are more important than the others if it's all N01? This is my favorite part. The answer is, what do you do? Nothing, because deep learning does the feature extraction for us. That's the beauty of deep learning. That's why deep learning thrives on data. There's no such thing as too much data for deep learning. However, if you don't have enough data, maybe you have more columns than rows, what do you do? For example, with image recognition, well, there are some standard machine learning algorithms that you can use. You could do something like uh, k-means. You could use uh, SVM, support vector machine. So knowing what to do, when and how and what, means acquiring a certain amount of knowledge of deep learning as well as machine learning to understand the nuances. Because some of the things that happen are not intuitive. For example, I didn't go into it, but there's something called the drop rate. Jeffrey Hinton. So if you have, I was talking about overfitting, so uh, that means that some of the noise is treated as though it were a signal. So how do you fix it? One technique, you just drop nodes. You have 20%, 30, 40. Seems a little crazy, but it works. So the things to do don't necessarily align with your intuition. And that's why having the experience of different situations is what will help to guide you. And that's what's time consuming. Because getting that information, there's no one place that has it. And if you find it, please tell me. Some more thing I mentioned, well, here's the dropout rate. Um, just some of the things in there. These aren't really that important right now, but later on if you want to go over this again. And um, dropout rate, we can skip that. How many hidden nodes? We kind of went through that. CNNs versus RNNs. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with RNNs. They're a lot more complicated, not intuitive, and difficult to train, and more difficult to describe, especially the sort of the main thing right now with one of them, with RNNs, is LSTMs, long short-term memory that gives you the ability to keep history. It's kind of like RNNs are stateful entities, CNNs are stateless, if you want to make an analogy. So for example, when you have a self-driving car, you've got images coming in, 
Each one is processed as a CNN, convolutional network. Now, if you want to <laughs> make sure you don't collide with anything, you've got to keep track of the history of where something's moving. That's where you have the LSTM. So you have image stuff, you identify the LSTM, gives you the history, and then you manage to avoid the collisions and other things in theory. That doesn't always work because there was a car about a month ago driving, what was it, 55 or 65 miles an hour that hit a stationary fire truck. Does anybody remember that? So when you're a self-driving vehicle is following another vehicle and that vehicle moves out of the way, it sees a stationary object it's like on the highway, the expressway, you know those signs up there? Oh, you can ignore them, they're not moving. That was essentially the logic from what I understand. So the solution, apparently all these systems have that flaw. And Elon Musk is convinced that it can all be done in software. Some people say it needs to be done using more hardware, more sensors. So I guess time will tell how that works out. So the thing with CNNs, as I mentioned, is mainly for image processing, but also for audio. And about 60% of all, CNN, of all uh, ne neural networks are CNNs. So this is probably worth your while to learn. And I'll just give you the basic sort of minimalistic scenario, and then all the variations are the more interesting ones, the ones that you would actually do when you're solving a problem. Uh, what happens is that there's this filter process, it's a convolution, followed by a ReLU, followed by max pooling. Now the filter process is kind of interesting. You don't have to come up with the numbers, but typically you have an image, you'll have a 3x3 three three filter. The system generates it. Usually you request, oh, give me 8 3x3s. Three Usually it's a power of 2 or 16 or whatever. And so you have nine numbers, and you match it up on the top left corner with the image. So you kind of, it's like an inner product of two three by three vectors. So you have nine products, eight sums, and you get one number. You move that filter across and generate these numbers, so you populate another array of numbers. And if you go over one at a time, it's the stride. Stride can be one or more, horizontal, vertical, they're independent. And you can also, since it's going to be smaller, you can also pad it with zeros. And then, that's done before the filtering, by the way, a little detail there. And so you end up with a, something called a feature map. And the idea, it's actually based on the way our eyes work, which is different parts of our eye can recognize different shapes. Some will vertical line or horizontal or maybe like an oval shape. That's the idea. It's emulating that. Not the neuron stuff, just your actual eye. So that's how it was modeled. So you come up with these uh, feature maps. They're not images. You could treat them as that. You will see something. However, because of the numbers that generally are integers between negative 2 and 2, you could end up with values that are negative, so that's where ReLU comes in. Negative is replaced by zero. And before getting too far with that, here's an example. So you see that green square? And you see this one here? Only the top row, there's the one, the product with the 42, the result is 42. It doesn't start there, but that's you know kind of partially through that process. That's what I was trying to explain before. And so <clears throat> that is a very simple filter, probably kind of useless. You need more stuff. And here's some examples. That will sharpen your image. This one will blur. The blur is because they're all the same values. So you kind of, as you move across, then it's like a neighborhood of this point, And it takes into account its neighbors. So it smooths the peaks but it also makes the image a little bit duller. And so if you need to, I mean, that's what you use. And here's the uh, detecting edges, emboss. These filters are in uh, Photoshop and those other things, all the tools, th these are it. These are the filters they're using and others. 
So what would happen if you had just a one in the middle? What would that be? It would be kind of like the identity filter because it would just pick up just whatever is in that particular cell and replicate that. What if you had a one in the middle and a negative one on the left? Well, when you have two consecutive adjacent pixels of the same color, the sum would be what? Zero. So you're going across zero, 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 and then it changes. What does that mean? You hit a boundary. Otherwise, it's all the same color and there's nothing in there. It's just one single, same consistent color. So those, even that simple little filter can help you detect edges. So there's vertical and horizontal, and then it's cumulative. So the edge stuff that's detected, the next layer in the neural network will then kind of figure out, oh, there's these polygons or ellipses. And then it starts getting into the features, putting them together to actually recognize you know, it's a head, it's an arm, and then finally, it's a man sitting at a table with a cat on the table, or whatever it is. So that's the part with, you know, the first two parts. Here's Max Pooling. Again, simplest scenario, two by two subdivision. Take the largest number. And that gives you something that's half as wide and half as tall. You're throwing away 75% of the values. Why does this work? I give you an analogy with compression algorithms for binary files, there are two types. There's lossless and there's lossy. What is JPEG? It's lossy, but it works. So that's kind of the idea. However, put a big asterisk next to this. Because Jeffrey Hinton, who was involved in coming up with this, uh, he said, and I'm not, I don't have the exact quote, but pretty close. He said, the success of Max pooling has been a disaster for convolutional neural networks. Uh, he's one of those soft-spoken, brilliant contrarians, and he's been right so many times that when he says something, he's probably onto something. And so it's something called capsule networks. We'll look at that a little bit later. So now you know, oops, before we get there, so we do the filters, we get the feature maps, do the ReLU max pooling, and then do it again. And then, the, so the, the filters are for extracting features. Then we have to do something to do the classification. That's another part. That's the fully connected layer. So because of the processing, those Feature maps have to be stretched out into one-dimensional vectors. They're all strung together. Each one of those points is a neuron. Each one of those neurons is connected to the output. So here it happens to be four of these things. But in, like in MNIST, there'd be the digits zero to nine. So these are like buckets. And that's where the softmax comes in. So you got the whole thing connected, softmax to the out. And then, I'm skipping details. Do you also have a modified version of backpropagation that we described earlier? It's a little bit different because max pooling isn't a differentiable function. So you have to, it does some internal stuff to keep track, it all works. And again, supplying all these images and updating the values for those filters to get better feature maps, to get that whole mess connected, max pooled, and then there's a set of numbers between zero and one, whose sum is one, take the maximum, it's a dog, or it's a three. Remember, they're only approximations. It doesn't come out as 100% probability. It might be 80%. But it works, even, so, even though it's not close to 100%, on average, the aggregate, there's a high percentage of success. And so the idea is, coming up with convolutional neural networks that are better. Now, the, uh, two years ago, somebody won a competition 
before I mentioned something about trying things. So what these guys did, they took that max pooling, they did that immediately. No processing, they threw away 90, 75% of the image. They won the contest. That was one of the things they did, among other things. So it's these kind of simple, non, not necessarily intuitive combination of different things that you do, and it works based on your data set. So there's no real a priori, a priori way of knowing what will be the best. That's where the creative work comes in. And of course, all the processing time that's involved. So it can be very time consuming. So you get a team, one person does infrastructure, one does algorithms, one does modeling. And then you have a fourth person maybe, and then you kind of pool your knowledge together. That usually works better than flying solo with those competitions. So that uh, kind of gives a, the view of the first part of uh, convolutional neural networks. And so, at this point, just want to pause and say one thing. You might be thinking, you know, this deep learning stuff, maybe they just got lucky a few times, but most of it is just kind of fluff. That's a fair assessment. I have two things to say. First, there's something called the Universal Approximation Theorem, which states that any continuous function in the plane can be represented arbitrarily closely by a neural network. For those of you who remember, remember we had Taylor series, it's a polynomial expansion of a continuous function or differentiable one. Then there's Fourier series, it's a combination of sine and cosine for partial differential equations, you know, those boundary value problems, which I really liked. And so now we have this. I was actually quite surprised, but it really does work. Now, th the thing is that there's, there are a lot of continuous functions in the plane. And remember, a subset of continuous functions is the differentiable ones. There's plenty of those. In fact, there is an uncountably infinite number of continuous functions in the plane, each of which can be represented arbitrarily closely by some neural network, which tells you that the expressive power of neural networks is immense. If that doesn't convince you, that's okay. Last summer, I think it was, there was a company that, a uh, startup, they created a uh, barcode scanner for blind people. And the sort of state of the art up until then was a $1,300 device. Theirs was $20 using a deep learning. And, you know, it didn't do much. It's only $20. And they trained it. And apparently, it would read, scan the barcodes. And then after a while, what happened was, this little barcode scanner learned how to read the dietary information. You know, the ingredients, the percentage. Nobody trained it. Nobody planned. Maybe it was, you know, version two of the product. I don't know. No one could explain it. My answer is the power of deep learning. So this is sort of a nice little feel-good story. Some of you might be thinking, well, first we've got the barcode scanner, and then it's Skynet 2, and I'm not worried. So anyway, that's just a little anecdotal sort of background to give you the idea that maybe there is something to this stuff. And I think I may have taken this out, maybe. Um, I don't have it in here. Um, yeah. The, I mentioned capsule networks. They are an alternative to the CNNs, meaning without the max pooling. So you take that out, and instead of having individual hidden layers, they're kind of grouped together in containers or capsules. And there's this routing mechanism and voting pattern, algorithm rather, and there's code on GitHub for this. And so the purpose is to try to capture the relationship between the whole and the part. So, for example, if you have a, a face, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, um, then there's something I call the Picasso face, you know, where the nose is in the mouth, the mouth is up in the eye. If you look at a standard CNN, it's translation invariant. So it goes, oh yeah, there's, there's a mouth and a nose and two ears, so it's a face. 
capsule networks prevent that from, or are not as prone to being deceived by that. It will detect the fact it's not a face. Why am I saying this? Well, because there's something called uh, generative adversarial networks. I don't know if you've heard of those, but they are, there are ways to take an image, modify the pixels in a very, in a way that's imperceptible to the human eye, and yet defeat any neural network. There are lots of techniques to defend against that. All have been defeated. And so, why is that important? Well, if you're in your self-driving vehicle, and it's a you stop sign and it thinks it's a speed limit, that could be catastrophic. And it gets worse. A few months ago, somebody put up a paper, an archive, with an algorithm that describes how to mess up the image by modifying one pixel. So it's obviously very important, and capsule networks are more resistant to that sort of uh, deception, if you will. They can also do some other things that are better than the other networks. However, they're diff more difficult to train. They're slower, I think, uh, more complicated. They're not perfect, there are flaws, and so on and so forth. Jeffrey Hinton's been working on it since 2011, so he's been very tenacious about it, and you can find stuff online about that. So that's generative adversarial networks. And the interesting thing is, originally it was done by Ian Goodfellow four years ago to generate synthetic data. So if you don't have enough data, generate this nice stuff and mix it all in together, and then that was kind of the concomitant effect, if you will. Nobody expected that. I'm not sure who came up with that idea, but um, there you have it. So, Keras is uh, written by someone who's working at Google, and it's a layer on top of TensorFlow. And it's, as I mentioned before, it's more intuitive. It's a lot easier, really, when you're first starting, because the APIs, you don't have to know, understand what's going on with the graph underneath, although it's on top of, care of uh, TensorFlow and also um, Theano as well. And another one I forgot. I think I noticed CNT, there we go, CNTK. So it's, um, well, I'll just show you. Remember we've been talking about models for the last 45 minutes? So for Keras, we import sequential. That's just like a container. There, there's another type. Not, not to worry about the other kind. It's a functional model. Layers, dense activation. We talked about activation. Dense means they're all connected. So between two layers, every node's connected to every other node. That's dense. Look what we have. Sequential, dense, through the input shape. See, when you have an image that's 28 by 28, remember I said you have to stretch it out to one dimension vector, one dimensional vector. 28 squared is 784. So that's the input data, the pixels, numbers, between 0 and 255. Activation, ReLU. Another dense layer, activation, softmax. You already kind of know what this is doing, sort of. And then the model summary. Oh, by the way, you put this in a, you know, abc.py. And then you type Python, abc.py, and you run it. And this is what you get for the summary. It tells you, you see the dense layer, oh, it's an activation, blah, 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 gives you the parameters. Even that little neural network there, 25,000 parameters. It's not unusual to have 500,000 parameters, 10 million. And that's the stuff with the activation function, with the cost function and all that stuff, that's all the work is being done. The no, that's really number crunching. And here's another one. We talked about CNNs. Um, there's sequential at the top, dense I just mentioned, dropout, we talked about that, flatten, straight one dimensional vector, activation, convolutional import conv2d, the convolution I was telling you about, the filters, max pooling, add a delta, the optimizer, the gradient descent technique, 
Input shape, it says we're going to have 32 by 32 image. There's going to be three channels. I didn't go into it before, but it's separated into R, G, and B. The model is sequential. Look, look what we're doing. Add conv2D, 32 filters, 3 by 3, padding is the same. Input shape is that up there. Add activation ReLU. It's, you know all of this already. So let's take a look at TensorFlow. It's uh, kind of a deferred computation graph is what it is. If you've looked at ASTs, abstract syntax trees, on steroids, it involves using um, tensors, which are multidimensional arrays. And so what happens is that, this is a little bit non-intuitive. It, uh, it okay, just more stuff about what it can do, the typical stuff that you expect. And I'll show you a little bit about TensorBoard in a couple of minutes. So here are the use cases, pretty much standard stuff, no surprises, going a little quickly here. And so what you have, I mentioned there's a notion of the graph, edges, nodes, operations, lazy execution, a session. In order to actually make something happen, you have to invoke a session and its run method, and then stuff happens. That's why it's deferred. There's also eager execution, which is, makes it look more Python-esque, and that's more recent. It's not available in the standard download. It's pip install TensorFlow. If you want the eager execution, pip install tf-nightly. You get that. That's in 141. The latest version of TensorFlow, I think, right now is 1.6. And if you want it for the GPU, pip install tf-nightly-gpu. So what happens is, I mentioned already pretty much the same thing. You have a TF session object and you invoke the run method. For example, uh, next slide. Um, I'm just summarizing what I described here about the different order um, tensors. Generally, you won't go past four dimensional tensors. And those are actually what you use with CNNs. There are some people working with really large systems. There are five-dimensional tensors that they use, but that's not, it's unlikely that you're going to be doing that. And so we have three types, constant, placeholder, and variable. Try not to use constants because they get saved as part of the graph and they can bloat it. So you tend to prefer to use variables. And also, they can be, variables can be shared. This is some of the little details not to worry, you don't have to memorize it. And so, let's see, is the next one here? A little bit, okay, so look what we have. We import TensorFlow as TF, that's the standard TF as TensorFlow. We have a constant, TF constant. Notice ses, tf.session, and then what do we do? We print ses.run of that constant that we define, which is a zero-dimensional tensor. So the result is three. And then you have to close it. Do you like this? There's a little bit slightly simpler way. This saves you one line. You do with tf.sss, print that. Doesn't really save you a lot. You'll see it'll be better when we get to the eager execution. A little bit about arithmetic. The operators are full English words instead of the symbolic operators. And you get the results that you would expect when you perform those operators. We can skip over this. A little bit about uh, doing some other calculations. Notice we have some built-in functions. Approximating pi is that value. We have our CES defined. Let's go from the bottom up. What is, uh, first we're going to do div, tf div of tf sine pi over 4, tf cosine pi over 4. Sine over cosine is tangent of pi over 4 radians, 45 degrees. So that is going to be what? Ten, 1. What's cosine of pi radians? Negative 1. What's sine of pi radians? 0. So it should be 1, negative 1, 0. Not quite. 
The last two are correct, but there you have a approximate value. But we also were using an approximation for the value for pi. So in case you need to do highly precise calculations, just keep that in mind. Why does the tangent work, by the way? That was approximate too, right? Because sine and cosine of 45 degrees are equal. So the number is going to be the correct value plus error, some e. The bottom will be correct value plus e. Well, it's one. So it's just coincidental uh, serendipity or something like that. So here we have the part where we can feed in numbers. We can have placeholders. If you have written C programs, it's kind of like doing something like int x semicolon, and then later on you go x equals 3. So you declare it, and then you define the value. That's, that's kind of the idea. So we have a feed dictionary. And look what we do over here at the bottom. Sess.run, of course. C, we pass in this feed dictionary because C is the product of A and B. So we have to pass in values for A and B. That's how it works. And based on that idea, this probably makes more sense too because we have, what are we doing here? We're defining W, X, B. What does that suggest? We're going to do W times X plus B, linear regression. And so what we do is we define WX. It's called WX. And then Y is WX plus B. This is all deferred. Nothing's executed. Here, see the feed dictionary? W, X, W is fixed. X didn't have a value, so we had to pass it in a value. And then we get that result. If we want Y, W, X plus B, have to pass in something for X and something for B. Well, that's what that middle line is doing in the green. So we get that. So you can see the start here, where you can do linear regression, you, pretty much anything you want. But you have to build up the stuff. And compare that with Keras. In two slides, you saw what a convolutional neural network looks like. Here, we're just doing a line. Right? So you, I'm, not, I'm trying to be impartial, because I think part of the purpose of a presentation like this one is to show you the different things that are available so that you can make a more informed decision about what you want to do and what you can based on the constraints that you're in. So here's an example. The line in the middle, um, I didn't mention global variables initializer. That's another method that has to be invoked to initialize all these things that have been defined or de declared at the beginning but haven't been initialized. You have to invoke that. If you do this line in the middle, the file writer, it creates, it goes into that directory, puts in a file, and it saves what? session.graph. And so when you go into um, your browser, and I think I have it here, TensorBoard, th there's the graph. I mean, pretty trivial, but it shows you, and then you can highlight things and expand and drill. It's very nice when you're doing, trying to do some debugging, and it gives you the information on the left. And we didn't give these names, but you can do that. And the thing is, if you have 50 nodes, it's going to get a little bit messy, because the graph could be quite complex. Or 100. What if you have 500? What you can do is define components where, OK, all these things are inside of this one component, and then all the others in another component. For example, there's another benefit to doing that beyond just a cleaner graph which is not intuitive, but when you hear it, it'll make sense. When you separate things into separate components, TensorFlow can execute those components on different CPUs and GPUs in parallel. You get that for free. That's nice. Another incentive for doing that. So in case you need to be concerned about that. so. Just going back to this, uh, let's see, what do we have? Eager execution, as I mentioned before, you have to, the specific download uh, when you install it. Um, there it is right there. 
I already told you, you, have to, you need to Python 3.x. And I already kind of told you what it does. So you have that line TFE. You enable eager execution. Now we have X defined as a one-dimensional array, tensor. Multiply by itself, we get four, which is pretty much what we wanted in the first place. So which do you prefer, eager execution or the regular style? Obviously, this is going to be uh, better. Now, as far as performance, I don't know. If you have a really large, massive system, one with traditional TensorFlow, the other one with eager execution, what the difference is in execution time. But that's something you can try. So here's a little bit of TensorFlow and convolutional neural network. We have a Python function where you know, we're passing in all this stuff and it will construct the neural network. This is kind of like the, um, the, the decorator pattern, if you're familiar with that. The decorator, yeah, I think it is the decorator pattern. So what we do here, we have noticed TF, the, the other stuff is of course not shown. And with the layers conv2d, notice we have input layer. And uh, this means that it's 28 by 28. There's one channel. This negative one is just a syntactic thing for Python. Let's not worry about that. Filters, 32. Kernel size, 5 by 5. Padding, ReLU. Now, one thing I didn't mention before about the variations with the uh, kernel size, the filter size, is 3x3 three three is kind of standard, but you could do 5x5, five five, obviously, and you can do 1x1. One one. Those guys that won the contest with the ReLU, with doing the max pooling first, they also did 3x3, 5x5, 1x1, and then they merged it all together. Is that intuitively obvious? I don't think I would have thought of that. But that shows you kind of the idea, trying different sorts of things to see how they work. Generally, they're odd sizes so that there will be one center point. That's a tiny little detail. So now we have the pooling layer at the bottom. After the conv1, we do what? Pool size, 2 by 2, strides 2. So it's the 2 by 2 subdiv, but it goes over to vertical, horizontal. Not so bad. And then, a little bit more, there's another convolutional layer. And then there's another pool, just like we did before. So th this code is actually not bad. And there's more stuff. If you want to see the full code, it's right here. And actually what I did do is I did have GANs. I just had it in a different place. So we have, what? A panda on the left, the weird thing on the middle, and a panda on the right. But look at the precision there. It's a gibbon with 99% accuracy. Remember, you, you don't see, do you see any difference between those, the left and the right? I don't. But look at all that stuff. And remember, you can do one pixel modification and defeat the neural networks. So I think we've actually already shown you all of this. And, oh, um, up until recently, the focus was on static images. You can also create your own if you want. And uh, there's a GitHub link, get the code. And also with MNIST, and here's the part I wanted to show you. It's very hard to see. So what people have done recently is applying GANs to audio. So you can corrupt that sound file in the sense that it'll say something else than what you expected. I think it gives new meaning to fake news. <laughs> so in my kind of warped mind, I'm thinking, we're going to get to the day fake images, fake news. We're going to wake up one morning and go, what's my name? I don't know. It's fake. Everything's fake. I mean, sorry, I'll find a tangent here. And so there's also a nice little link over there. If you go there, I have no affiliation with anything. Just I found this. You upload two images, and it does the convolution. And there's a lot of public stuff that's there that people have done. It's really nice, and you can upload your own. And uh, I won't go into the ones that I did, but I took, I'm not an artist, so I took my SVG code that's in some JavaScript, generated some images, and then I took some celebrities, and I kind of merged them together. Some of them were nice, some of them were a little lame, but you can try it on your own and see. And 
There's a ton of stuff you can learn. If this felt like a fire hose, it's just a trickle. <laughs> That's what somebody told me, actually, about my presentation about three months ago. Lots of stuff that you can do. And you know the T model for learning? You learn something in depth, and then you're kind of horizontal. I call it the pyramid model, where you got a pile of sand, and if you want to go add another foot or more of vertically, you got to pour a ton of sand because it spreads out. So you're learning horizontally and vertically. That's very time consuming, especially if you're doing it on your own to find stuff. So I recommend, you, there's Udacity stuff, Udemy, videos there, videos on YouTube, Kaggle, blog posts, do a little this, a little that, go to meetups, talk to people, share the knowledge and get some reinforcement. Because it really is a lot about reinforcement and repetition as well as the you know the technical details but it's the familiarity is a very significant part of that and just about done last two slides just a few of the books i've written the uh, reg x book is coming out i think in bay and i do some training and uh, that is basically it hope you got something out of it thanks for your attention Thank you so much, Oswald. So um, if folks have any questions, I can bring you the microphone. If you want to raise your hand, start here in the back. Only questions that I know the answer to, please. That's the requirement. <laughs> OK, sweet. So I'll bring you the microphone, sir. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, can you uh, speak a little bit more about like when Pixel can screw up the whole network? I have not read the algorithm. I'm sort of worried that when I read it, I'll get scared that it's so simple anybody can do it. I'm sort of half facetious, but if you read the paper online, I don't know the details, but apparently he has succeeded in constructing such an algorithm. I don't. I don't know the details, oh, okay. but someday I will make myself read it. Awesome. Any other questions? If you raise your hand, gentleman in the back. Oh yes. So Oswald, we'll post the slides on SlideShare within like the next two weeks. Um, this was recorded. Thank you, Mark, and we'll post it on YouTube as well within the next two weeks. Yeah. All Anything right. else? All right. All right. Um, so actually, let me check here, Oswald. I think we had two more questions. Um, let me see here. Um, somebody asked how to test a neural network in, in the software world. It's either true or false. Very good question. I should know the answer. I do not. There is some, there are a few blog posts you can find online that address that specifically. Um, and so, yeah, I'll figure that one out too. All right, and final question. Um, is the neural network training process similar to methods like newton raphson method to compute square roots? Yes. Where you iterate and wait for close values? <laughs> you can use Newton's method. That is actually one technique that's used. This is all uh, the gradients that are computed, this first order derivatives, but you can use quadratic kind of rate, and it's a second order. Uh, iteration, I um, forgot the exact name, but yes, those there are those techniques. Awesome. Okay, Great. any more questions? All right, well, thank you so, so much. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for coming. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it.